I get so used to certain way of working that any attempt to force on me what I'm going to use and how I'm going to use would not end up well. I'm probably spoiled Brett. This is DevOps Paradox, episode number 270. Why should a developer consider using DevBox from Jetify? Welcome to DevOps Paradox. This is a podcast about random stuff in which we, Darren and Victor, pretend we know what we're talking about. Most of the time, we mask our ignorance by putting the word DevOps everywhere we can and mix it with random buzzwords like Kubernetes, serverless, CICD, team productivity, islands of happiness, and other fancy expressions that make us sound like we know what we're doing. Occasionally, we invite guests who do know something, but we do not do that often since they might make us look incompetent. The truth is out there, and there is no way we are going to find it. P.S. It's Darren reading this text and feeling embarrassed that Victor made me do it. Here are your hosts, Darren Pope and Victor Farson. Victor, what is one of the first things that you do when you get a new computer? Open the box. Okay, after you open the box, and you take the computer out of the box, and you take off all of the things, and you plug it in, what's one of the first things that you do? That's not fair. You just took away like five answers from me. Am I participating in this or no? You are starting now. (laughs) Okay, starting now. Okay. Yes. So install all the stuff that I need. And all the stuff is a lot. Right? Some things are already there, like Z shell and Git, at least if you're talking about Mac, I'm not sure what's the situation with Windows. But then first thing Always first, 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 Chrome, right? Because I need to download stuff and then start with Visual Studio Code and uh, whatever other desktop application like Slack I'm using. That's the easy part. And then goes a bunch of different packages, in my case with Brew, like install Go, install uh, whatever else I'm using, right? Uh, KCL and Chainsaw and, you know, what? what's an average person probably has like infinite number of CLIs that they use, hopefully, right? And then a couple of days later, I'm done. Until, until, wait, wait for it, until I start working on the first project and realize that that first project has some CLI or some binary or something that I did not install and that it requires a specific version of some other binary that I did install, but not with the version I want. And then the next day I might be working and this, this is probably specific to me because people probably don't go crazy and work on an infinite number of projects. But then the next day I start working on a different project and this whole cycle repeats. That probably sounds like 98 98- Point three percent of every developer setting up a new machine anytime they get a new machine or they do the crazy thing and blow away the OS and do a fresh install. There is a solution to that. Are you ready? Don't use any CLIs. Don't use terminal. Just do everything with VS Code. But could then I just get away with using a underpowered machine? Why even use VS Code? Uh, yeah, but you know, clickety click. Why not? Okay, clickety click. That's where I want to start. So let's let's talk about how we used to do things before the days of package managers. Now, Mac before OS brew and stuff. Well, as I'm saying, before on Mac we've got brew. In fact, you can use brew on Linux. It's not one to one mapping, but you know it's close enough. But on Linux, you've got apt, you've got rp or not. Uh, you've got DNF, you've got yum, you've got all the tools. You got zipper. You can Chocolate-y. do all that. Choc- over on Windows, we got actually my preference is WinGet these days, but you know, oh, okay, you've got those. Windows. Okay, but anyway, I try not to. But with these package managers, bef- there was a time before package managers, at least in the Mac and Windows days. What did we have to do then? The first step was still right. You downloaded and installed whatever the browser was that you wanted. Because the browser that ships with pretty much every OS is not the one that you're wanting to use. Of course. You think about Windows, it was IE. On Mac, it's Safari. (sighs) Safari is fine, right? Safari is fine. IE wasn't so much. 
Yeah, well, the problem I have with Safari is more that you know I have everything in Chrome history. That's the only reason. But yeah, Safari is good. IE wasn't so much, but it's gone now, so I can say that about it. But then we would get our browser, and then we would start going to download things. Now, if we were on an internal network, we'd probably map our SMB drive to the window share and then find the installers for the things that we needed. But we still had to go through and clickety-clack, install everything one by one. I, I guess that you're talking about back in the day when downloading something meant click a button, download starts, and then you go for a coffee. And you don't take coffee in your own house because that doesn't take enough time. You go out for a longer one. Is that the time you're talking about? I'm actually talking about the time when we actually went to offices to where we actually had fast internet. Oh. But you would still get up and take a coffee break while things were downloading or at least installing. So these days weren't that long ago. And by not long ago, I'm saying 20 years ago. You could even say 10 years ago and in some places, 10 minutes ago. But what do we have now? We've already talked about it. What should we be doing now today, at least as a step one? I think the step one is we shouldn't be downloading things manually anymore, at least not everything. I think there's still a handful of things we still have to do manually. Would you agree with that? A few, not many anymore. So it depends if you're talking about ideal situation and, and I must put a note here, ideal situation, which I haven't tried yet. And the reason why I haven't tried what I'm going to explain is because uh, I haven't changed the computer for a while, right? So I haven't had a fresh one, but that's coming. But ideally, and I'm not going to even use a specific tool at the moment, you would go and download the file that describes everything you need and just click uh, execute some command and then the process starts. Download, install, copy, do whatever needs to be done. That's the ideal situation. And as a matter of fact, going back to the golden days of the office that you were mentioning, that's how I was actually getting my computer. I remember the, the last one was maybe 15 years ago when I joined one of the companies and they gave me a computer, company computer, and that company computer already had everything I need. And if there is something I don't need, I, I, I need and it's not there, then I did not have an option because that's kind of prescribed what I need, right? Well, that's the term ghosting. You would ghost an image and you'd have a new machine in under an hour, which was great. Yes, I don't know whether that's still happening. And it it's, it's, it is? Okay. Oh, yeah. But that's a world I don't want to. I, I would reject to work in a company like that, to be honest, anymore. It sounds interesting, but then usually with that comes all the restrictions. Oh, you cannot install anything without our permission and all this stuff, right? It is. It doesn't bother me a whole lot because it's their machine, their rules. Okay, fine. If that's the way it is, that's the way it is. But the upside of that is, as you were saying, I need something else. Now it has to go through potentially procurement, even if it's free, because it still has to get approved. It has to go through security and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, look, I guess I don't need that tool. I'll suck it up and use whatever they have on the machine. I simply, I, I get so used to certain way of working that any attempt to force on me what I'm going to use and how I'm going to use would not end up well. I'm probably spoiled breath. We're going down a really bad rabbit hole. Let's not do this because we could devolve into a conversation that we don't want to have. <laughs> okay. All right. Just because. Okay. So let's say we're on Mac OS or we're mm -hmm. on windows and we're using brew or Winget, or mm -hmm. whatever the case is, right? We had a good potentially starting base image of something, whatever it is. But by base image, I'm meaning that it's pretty much vanilla. We're not using your story of the nice ghosted image that had everything in its place. That's not what we're talking about. And I'm using Brew, I'm using Winget, but now I need to have, maybe in your case, seven versions of Go installed. And you're needing to switch between each of those. That just seems silly to me. I think you're leading me down the path of talking about Nix, aren't you? We're, we're, well, that is one path that we're going to go down. That's an important thing of, okay, 
in my company or on the projects I'm working on, I'm using Go, I'm using Java, I'm using even worse, Node.js. And I need to keep a specific version of something, but that specific version of something is only good for this one project because these other projects need another version. No, I, I think that for this story, it's important, or I feel it might be important to split the tools into general or universal and those specific to a project. And the first group is, at least in my case, typically desktop applications, like that's Slack, it's Visual Studio Code, that's Docker, right? Or whatever else I'm using of that kind that are there, probably open all, all the time. And then there are tools that are specific to the project, right? I go and I want to work on this project, I clone that repository, or maybe I already have it cloned. And then to work on that project, I need X, Y, Z, whatever that something is, right? So I feel that there are project specific tools and general tools that are simply always there, right? And those project specific tools, ideally, and I'm repeating, I, ideally, in a ideal situation, should be versioned, right? Because it actually does matter that we are all on the same page version of I don't know, whatever testing tool we're using, right? So that we don't run into work on, works on my machine type of situation, right? We never want to go back there again. It's one thing to have browsers be out of version sync. Those will eventually get there. But if you've baked in an install of Go or Java or whatever, you are not going to get that back anytime fast if you're needing to switch. I mean, you could write scripts, you write aliases, whatever, to make all the switching, but that just seems silly, especially now in 2024. You've already talked about Nix just a little bit. I don't want to go there yet, though. I want, I want to hold there for just a second. Let's, let's okay. stick with these general tools. You use Brew, I use Brew. Do you use a Brew file, though? No, no, I don't. You should. Maybe. Uh, if I would tell you what I'm using, then I would need to go to where you said I'm I, I'm not supposed to go. Go ahead and say what you're using. <laughs> is, using is it just Dev a Box. shell script that has... Oh, you're using Devbox. Okay. Well... Yes. Okay. De Devbox allows me... Uh, allows both global... To, to install something globally and uh, locally. When I say locally, I don't mean locally in my laptop, but directory wise, right? Uh, specific to a directory, which uh, is the same as a project. So I, can, I can use DevBox to install Visual Studio Code, for example. Right. So rewind everything we just said. If I handed you a new machine today, mm -hmm. what is the very first thing that you install on it? DevBox. DevBox. Yes. Okay. DevBox. And then with DevBox, I would get the the generic or global tools I need. And uh, later on, when I start working on a project, I would get those that are specific to the project. And you would get those through DevBox as well? Or would you do that in a different way? Yeah, also through DevBox, right? There are just okay. different modes. I'm not sure what... Normally, it works on a directory where you are or where DevBox JSON is. And then there is a global mode. I'm not sure whether that's how it's called, but let's call it global for a second. So let's rewind again one more time. Old days, download, click through the wizards and wait. Next up, we used package managers when we could. Now we're in this cycle of tools, whether it's Nix, whether it's DevBox. DevBox is Nix, actually. It's a wrapper around Nix. It's a wraparound. It's yeah. why why does DevBox end up being quote unquote better than Nix to you? Uh, the syntax is just simply easier, right? I can give you now DevBox JSON and you will figure it out in, in, in a split of a second, right? Nix, you need to wrap your head around it. Arguably the part of managing packages in or downloading packages, installing packages in Nix in Nix is the easiest part of Nix, but still it's it's a bit funky syntax, right? So what if I can't use DevBox? And I can't use Nix because a lot of places may not allow that. Then you do what you can. I mean, it depends, you know, kind of, I don't know. Are you allowed to have internet? Let's assume yes. I will assume that when you say you're not allowed to have DevBox, uh, would I would 
change that then correct me if I'm wrong kind of like you're not allowed to have some specification according to which certain packages will be downloaded right so because kind of what did you say you said brew list i haven't used but i'm guessing that it's kind of a list of brew packages you want installed right uh, it's a brew file where you define what packages you want there installed. you go so yeah. that's conceptually the same at this dev box so i assume that if you're not allowed one then you're not allowed the other one either right that's that probably a safe feature. assumption yeah yeah because if you're not allowed those things, that means that you're probably not allowed to install stuff on your own, right? Right. And then you just use whatever you're given. That going back to that machine that I was getting a long time ago from a company, right? And that a lot of people still get today. Yeah, and then you don't have a choice. Right? That's um, That's what it is. So that means we're stuck between a rock and a hard place. I'm on one of these lockdown monolithic machines and i'm not allowed to make any kind of changes yeah that's that's horrible uh you you said kind of that you you're fine with it i'm not fine and the reason is very simple because i'm not fine with anything that makes me less productive and i need to be as productive as possible so that i can do whatever i need to do faster and have more time for whatever i want to do that's why productivity matters. I have more free time to do the things that yeah, I'm not supposed to be doing, right? And if you limit my productivity, then no bueno. It's basically telling me from a productivity standpoint, I am the architect sitting on high. I have said, these are the tools that you must use. I don't care if something is better, faster, or you're just more comfortable with it. Uh, this is what I say, therefore, this is what it is. I have an example of this, by the way. There was a time I was doing consulting, and nobody. this was you know, probably late 90s, early 2000s. And we were not allowed to use any other editor than VI. That was it, VI. And you had a shell that you connected up to a remote Linux box. That's it. That's all you had. You know, I was in those situations as well, just to make it clear, right? Um, fortunately, I'm not now anymore, but that's a deal breaking for me, right? You know, and, and not because of the reasons I said before. Oh, because I don't want to use VI, right? But simply because if you are capable of making such a silly rule, and you could have come up with a better rule, just to clarify, kind of something that does make sense. But hey, I'm going to stick with that one. You must use VI, you cannot use Nano. If that's the length of how, of your stupidity, then I cannot be working with you. Let's just say it was interesting times. I'll leave it at I that. Know. I know. I was in the same boat, just to be clear. I was in the same boat. I had tools. I had to use uh, what Eclipse. I couldn't use Visual Studio at that time. I had to use this, I had to use that. I was in the same situation. Right? I just feel that the world changed since then. And that I hope that companies realize the difference between what you must do for specific reason and what you must do because I say so. So I understand that you can say, hey, you cannot connect to corporate network without VPN. And I'm going to ignore now whether a VPN is a good choice or a bad choice, but, but it's a bad choice, by the way, but ignoring that for a second. That makes sense because that's a rule that says, hey, security-wise, you cannot do this, right? That makes perfect sense. Now, I cannot imagine justification for you have to use VI, you cannot use Nano. There is no justification for that. And if that's the rule, then we have a serious problem over there. If I remember correctly, they actually uninstalled Nano from the machines that we were SSHing into. It was that extreme. Yeah, well, what can I say? I mean, again, I was in the same boat. The world was like that. I just hope that it's not like that anymore. Would you accept it today, Darin? I could not accept that today. But what can I accept? I can accept 
some new, fresh Cuban hot sauce. <laughs> Are you ready to spice up your life while you try to optimize your new development machine? Meet Barbaro Mojo, the delicious Cuban hot sauce with a kick that's sponsoring today's episode. Barbaro Mojo brings the heat with our unique Cuban marinade base, adding an unforgettable flavor to your favorite dishes. With flavors like El Habanero, Jalabo, Panazzo, and Best Day Ever, there is a perfect match for everyone's taste buds. Not only are these hot sauces gluten-free and vegan, but they're also perfect for spicing up your work-from-home lunches or adding an extra kick to your weekend barbecue. Trust me, you don't want to miss out on this chance to taste the best Cuban hot sauce out there. So go ahead and order your bottle of Barbaro Mojo today and remember to use the promo code DEVOPS25, that's DEVOPS, the number two and the number five, to get 25% off your first order. Thanks to Barbaro Mojo for sponsoring today's episode. Okay, so I've got my machine. Thankfully, I don't have to fight the VI and Nano arguments anymore. Are you convincing me now that I really need to just use DevBox? There's no reason why I shouldn't use DevBox across my everything. I'm using it. So I, I'm not, I haven't used it yet for the first case, meaning fresh machine where I would install Visual Studio and Chrome and what's not. I haven't done that yet. I just know that it works. But I am using it for a while now, every single day, multiple times a day for specific projects. And I cannot, Im I don't know of a better solution, right? I literally, every single project I start working on is CD into the directory, devbox shell. That's the first two commands, always. Is there any way we could shorten that up? Shorten it like DS? Yeah. Or, yeah, I mean, have obviously we could, right? But, you know, shortcuts I don't feel are that important anymore because it's all autocomplete. Let's D and already I have it, you know, just click the right button to the right and that's it. Now we're talking about DevBox and unfortunately or fortunately, there's a lot of DevBoxes out there. The DevBox we're talking about is from Jetify. Jetify.com is where you want to go. Yeah. It used to be a different company name, but now it's Jetify. It's something that I need to do. Just to give you an idea how committed I am to it now, you, I, I do videos that always have gist with the hands-on and I try never to introduce something that is not necessary for that specific project or demo or whatever. That box is in every single gist I'm making for a while now. Is there a reason why people wouldn't want to use that box? I haven't found a single issue myself yet. Or a reason. Now, I haven't tried it on Windows and Linux. I know it works there. I just cannot confirm that it's so smooth as, as my experience is with Mac. If you're being given a new machine today and you're given a choice, try, try to put out all your biases. I know this is going to be hard. Mm -hmm. Would you pick Mac OS, Windows, or Linux? Mac OS, without doubt. Why is that? So let me tell you first what I dislike about Mac or Mac in, or Apple in general, right? I, I, I feel and I see how they're looking mean. I see the walls of that garden being always higher and higher, right? And how I'm, with every passing day, less likely to get out. I see that clearly, right? But it's so nice inside. It's so freaking nice, right? MacBook itself, right? Simply hardware-wise, I don't think that there is anything comparable with uh, silicon, Apple Silicon chips. I don't think that, there is, that anything can match it, right? I know that uh, Snapdragon is coming with something that is likely going to be almost like M3 at whenever it's released, right? Uh, which is not a good sign. But more than hardware, it simply works. And I cannot, actually, I'm, I might not be the best person to talk about it because my experience with other solutions is from some years ago, right? So I don't know how far Windows got or Linux got since the last time I used them, right? So I might be completely wrong. Back in the day, I was uh, mostly Linux Ubuntu person Every, every computer I got 
first thing I would do is wipe out Windows and put Ubuntu. That, that was my routine always. But I'm now too old to deal with problems. It never worked 100%. It never worked. I remember the last one, whenever I would close my laptop, it would continue working, you know, with fans going crazy, doing nobody knows. Kind of, it didn't know how to go to sleep when you close, the, close it, right? It sounds like a silly thing, but with Apple, I don't have those problems. It just works. And I know that I'm now speaking like a spoiled brat, kind of like, oh, Apple, right? But I just got so used to everything working, to be honest. And I'm not saying that Windows is not like that. But still, I would need to get, let's say that I'll go for Windows, I would need to get very well informed, right? Because, I don't know, which one of the 57 brands you, you take and which model of those you take, it, it's a bit confusing, right? I agree. I think going back to your, you were talking about closing the laptop and it's still spinning. Let me go to the other side of that. You close a Windows laptop, but then you try to reopen it. What kind of state is it going to be in? Whereas thinking about the 99.999% chance of any Mac laptop closing or opening is just going to happen. The flip side of that is that if you want to go out, it's becoming difficult. Like, for example, I have Apple Watch on my wrist right now, right? For those of you watching the video. If I would like some other watch, it's not a good option anymore, right? I'm, I'm locked, really. Because, like, notifications don't work well because uh, iPhones are, have, do not allow you to customize what it, uh, unless it's Apple Watch. And what's, I'm using Apple Watch as an example, right? But... And the ability to do to combine something with non Apple stuff is not is every time harder. We've gone down a bad path here. We probably should try to come back to what we were talking about. If I only remember what we talked about, we man. were talking about DevBox. It's been a while. Ah, DevBox. Yes, yes. Right. It's good. So, so going back to the let me let me draw the line again. So initially, we installed everything by hand. Then we came up with some sort of bash scripts or something to install things for us. Then we may have gotten ghosted images of a box. Then we saw Nix, but then Nix was like, eh, it works. But now we've got Debbox. So what's next after Debbox? What's going to be the next big thing? I don't know. I mean, you know, to know the next big thing in that area, I would first have to experience something very annoying with it. And I haven't yet. The only semi-annoying thing, to be honest, actually there is one, is that there are a few cases of some tools that I couldn't find as an X package. But on the other hand, that's true for all other package managers as well, right? Will we ever get to the point to where we don't need a package manager at all? Meaning everything will be in a browser and we can just get by with a Chromebook. If you ask me that like years ago, I would say certainly 100%, no doubt. But we're still, I feel that we went very far in that direction and then stopped somehow. I have a feeling that the remote development environments, probably what you're talking about, are still somehow not not there fully. There is always something that prevents me from... I, I Actually, I like the... One of the ideas I like the most is remote development environment. It's kind of just run it somewhere else and that's it, right? And you get everything you need. But I always come back to my laptop. Maybe, maybe the problem is that actually our computers now are more power, powerful than we need. Don't say that out loud. They'll charge more. But we're talking about that power. What we didn't have on our bingo cards, at least I don't think you and I did two years ago, was AI on the laptop or AI on the desktop. And soon to be AI probably on the phones. Oh, yeah, that's that's next iPhone. I'm sure of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a disaster, but yes. <laughs> so if if we are going to lose our possible perfect world of where we don't really need a machine and we could just get by with a Chromebook. 
And now, does that mean we're locked in buying new machines now again every three to five years? If you're locked into notebooks, why would we buy new? That means that we don't need more power, right? Well, I am still running a 2011 MacBook Air. Yeah. And do you need something better? And I'm excluding now video and audio editing from that. Yeah, for basic opening up VS Code to do basic things, I don't. Exactly. And that's where probably, again, excluding video and audio editing, right? That That's where with some remote development environment, you could probably continue using that same laptop for years to come, right? That, 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 that would be a good reason to use like code spaces, right? Absolutely. There's no reason why that wouldn't work for that. But then I do have workloads to where I need more power than a 13-year-old MacBook Air with 4 gig of RAM, right? That just... Oh, four, man. Okay, now, four. yeah, okay. Now I understand what you're talking about. I'm surprised that operating system starts with four, to be honest. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's gotten a little long in the tooth, but here's the thing. Back then, it was screaming fast. But if I was com to compare it to today, it's the exact same speed. I've just gotten used to everything else around me speeding up. Because everything is, you know, it's a chicken and egg problem, right? To me, that's similar problem like with games. Games are always going to, or at least AAA games, are always going to maximize, to, to try to use the last possible bit of a hardware where you're running, right? So the moment new, better hardware comes along, then everybody makes use of it, right? And okay, then we make even better games, right? And it's the same thing with what we do, right? Hey, now you can run even bigger database on your laptop. Why not? You can have even more tabs open, right? Or web pages can be uh, even more demanding on your, on your hardware. Client-side processing, why not? If we had technology to make web pages we're making today, uh, so reliant on client side. If we had that technology 10 years ago, we still couldn't use it. I guarantee that 10 types that you have no, right now open wouldn't work 10 years ago, hardware-wise. I agree with that. I, I don't know how it would even handle two tabs the more I think about it today. Not because of the number of tabs, but because of what people are writing that are within those tabs. And one of those things potentially over time is going to be wasm based workloads in the browser. There you go. Open, uh, what's the name? Google Earth in your browser on, on your old machine. Yeah, I should see how it falls back from that or if it just falls over. That's going to be one of the falls. I'm not sure which one it'll be. So in this episode, we've talked about installing software by hand all the way through to using DevBox to the bad old days to where here's your laptop, it sucks to be you, and then up to the point to where now we have our own machines and we can do with them what we want. Where should we really be, Vector? Right? We've, we've hit all these different bounding boxes. What is the sweet spot? The sweet spot is, I think, back to the ghost images, but without them being images. That, that's why I like kind of... Imagine the days when you could just load an image and you have everything your laptop needs, right? Now, the problem with those days is that it's an image and updating that image is not trivial and it's big and it's just simply silly, right? Because now we have internet. Why would you have a big image with everything you need? And this is, to me, this is equivalent. The only difference, the major difference between, let's say, Nix an image, and I'm ignoring the fact that it can have different packages in different directories, right? Uh, ignoring that for a second. But the major difference is that we have a specification just as with images, but then things are downloaded and installed when needed instead of being part of that image. And it makes it very easy to edit, right? Oh, you want a new version? Just change change this single character in, in a JSON file. Go, right? It makes it so so easy, and you and especially now, right? You can version, yeah, keep it in Git, right? Keep it in repository, easy. It makes me makes me want to buy a new computer just to try the try it out from scratch. To be honest, well, you could go buy a refurbished Mac Mini for 
$500, and that could be your test machine. I know, but there is a limit to how many computers I need, right? No, I don't, under I don't understand that. <laughs> is, is that a thing? Okay, yeah, you're right. Uh, now you remain. Okay, uh, you know what you just made me do? Ma you made me now go into uh, into Raspberry Pis or one of those. I'm going to buy something cheap just to try it out. No, see, okay, well, all right, with a Raspberry Pi, you can okay, here's the problem with that. By the way, I have lots of Raspberry Pis. Here's the deal, though. By the time you get one that's reasonable, you're going to be paying about, I'm thinking Raspberry Pi 5, and by the time you sort of get a kit that's got the fan and the correct power supply and all the, you know, the, the things, you're paying about $150. And what's that? How much, how many gigas is that? It's small. It's, it's not compared to, to establish, is that a lot of money or, or, or oh, so no. $150 compared to a, I could buy a refurbished M1 MacBook or excuse me, a, a refurbished M1 Mac mini for three times the price. Mm. What am I going to have? I'd prefer to have the Mac mini. I don't mind having yeah. the pie. I mean, there's, I've got use cases for pies, but from a development perspective, no, that's, it's still not enough today in my opinion or heck even just a intel based machine i can't believe i just said i wanted an intel based machine um you know five hundred dollars i think is the right price but anyway and and just test it out because i have got a machine that i've got to rebuild soon and i think the only thing i'm going to do is once i get the latest mac os on it the first thing i'm going to going to download is devbox and then see how it goes from there yeah i want to know and restrict myself, right? It's like, okay, I can't do, that's the only thing I can install manually. So looking at the install, it's, I'll go to the terminal, yes, the built-in terminal, and paste in the, cross my fingers, I hope it doesn't blow up line that installs everything from the internet, and then see what happens. In theory, from that point, everything should be in a JSON file. You should do it in a Friday stream. I should do it on a Friday live stream. That would be a very interesting hold on oh, for dear you life. Couldn't screen, you couldn't stream the screen without anything. No, I could. I could I could make that work. I just have okay. to figure it out again. I don't know when that will happen if you're listening to this. This is releasing on July 3rd of 2024. So if it happens, I'll try to remember to update the show notes on this one so you can go back and see the glorious failure that was probably that demo. Uh, yeah, or it may work. Who knows? So anyway, if you're not using DevBox, this is the key point to today. If you're not using DevBox, you should at least look at it. If you were thinking about going straight Nix, you can, but don't. Go to DevBox. Just a user-friendly wrapper around it. Yeah, you are still Nix. You're still using Nix. Uh, uh, Nix is under the hood. Do you? Can you break glass to get down to Nix inside of DevBox? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I actually have a one very strange, the only strange use case that I need something special for Magic Cloud CLI, and then I had to do it through Nix directly. That's that's the only case, right? So, but yeah, it's it's just a wrapper on Nix. I mean, it, it's not just a wrapper, but you can think of it that way. So, what do you think? Are you already all in on DevBox? Are you using Nix, or are you just still downloading everything by hand? Head over to the Slack workspace. Go over to the podcast channel and look for episode number 270 and leave your comments there. We hope this episode was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, please reach out to us. Our contact information and a link to the Slack workspace are at devopsparadox.com slash contact. If you subscribe through Apple Podcast, be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover this podcast. Go sign up right now at devopsparadox.com to receive an email whenever we drop the latest episode. Thank you for listening to DevOps Paradox.